are, and then we will turn it over to you. Good morning. This is the 36th District Democrats, and we are delighted to be interviewing Kathy Moore for City Council Position 5. Thank you so much for joining us, Kathy, and over to you to introduce yourself. Oh, good morning. Thank you very much for having me here today. My name is Kathy Moore, and I am a lifelong Seattleite, retired King County Superior Court judge, former public defender, um, small business owner, and mom of three Seattle Public Schools graduates. Over the course of my life, I have worked to improve systems to restore lives and build community. I'm running for this seat because District 5 needs a proven, experienced leader, and I'm the only candidate in this race who has ex proven experience making and upholding laws, advocating, ad advocating for marginalized individuals, and reforming broken systems. We need somebody who can hit the ground running, and I have the experience to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. Our first prepared question this morning will be asked by Alex. It will be in the chat as well as read out loud to you. Hi, good morning again. Uh, given the increasing incidence of smoke and extreme heat events in the Seattle area, what are both short and long-term steps the city can take to keep its residents safe and comfortable during dangerous weather? Hey, thank you for that question. So the issues of excessive heat and smoke and, uh, well, cold as well, are most, uh, those issues, those climate justice issues, most impact our residents, our BIPOC residents, our immigrant residents, our renter, renter communities, and our unsheltered. So it is critical that we uh, take steps, immediate steps, as well as long-term steps to address these issues. So one of the first things that we need to do is we need to um, revamp all our community centers and turn them into climate resilience hubs. So what does that look like? That means we need to, uh, we need to electrify them. Uh, we need to install HVAC. Uh, we need to install um, cooling centers there. Uh, so we need to install heat pumps um, that can be allowed for, uh, that can be utilized for cooling as well. Um, we also need to install rooftop solar microgrids. Um, and then um, in addition to that, we need to be uh, subsidizing heat pumps in, um, in, in, in uh, all buildings. Uh, we need to upgrade um, our investments um, into, um, sorry, we need to ensure that those investments go into communities that are most impacted by heat waves, pollution, displacement, and other environmental injustices. Um, and we need to move to the Green New Deal. So basically we need to electrify all of our buildings and we need to start that with the, um, the largest buildings and um, um, by um, <clears throat> electrifying all the buildings that are owned by the city of Seattle. <clears throat> and we also need to move, um, we need to upgrade all of our libraries so that they can continue to be resilience hubs. I are going to be rebuilding the Lake City Community Center, and that's a great opportunity to actually turn it into a climate. Thank you so much, Kathy. Our next question this morning will be asked by Sherry. It will also be in the chat. Hi. Um, economic projections show that the city will face a $250 million budget gap in 2025. What steps will you take as a council member to address it? Right. So um, this the the final report of the revenue stabilization work group um, sort of concluded um, didn't come up with any specific recommendations as to what we need to do, um, but it did look at the history. Um, of revenue and noted that revenue has been increasing since 2017. However, if you actually look at the report, it indicates that there was a huge dip in the revenue, obviously during COVID times, um, and that the um, we actually have been re losing revenue over this time, both due to COVID, due to low construction activity, due to high inflationary effects, um, the limit on property tax revenues, um, and declining um, um, revenue that's declining due to changing consumer preferences related to cable and tele uh, telephone utility taxes. 
So <laughs> this idea that um, that's been perpetuated that we don't have a revenue problem, we have a spending problem. I think when you look more deeply, you realize that we actually do, in addition, have a revenue problem. Um, <clears throat> and in fact, the revenue expenditures have been equal to the compounding effects of inflation and population growth. So we haven't been spending wildly or outside of what is sort of expected uh, when you combine those two. So what does that mean? That means that we actually need to go back. We do need to, I think, do a general audit to see where in fact our money is being spent and where in fact we can uh, find efficiencies. But I think even once we do that, we're going to realize that um, just tightening our belt is not going to be the end. So we need to look at progressive revenue tax, capital gains tax, an increase in the jumpstart tax, a CEO employee ratio tax, a vacancy tax. All of those can be accomplished without having to go to the state. Thank you, Kathy. I will ask our third question. The city has been in a homelessness state of emergency since 2015, yet our homelessness crisis has not receded. What are we doing wrong and what steps will you take to address this crisis? Uh, so <laughs> this is a huge issue. Um, I think initially, and I think I mentioned this in my earlier interview, I think initially when we declared homelessness an emergency, we still didn't treat it as an emergency. Um, and I think that that's been a problem for a long time. Um, and we have a lot of different actors and we have a lot of duplicative effort um, that isn't necessarily addressing the underlying issues. And um, so on a, on a ground level, those are those issues. I mean, you know, on a broader systemic issue, we don't have enough affordable housing, right? That's the basic problem. Um, and so we need desperately to increase the amount of affordable housing in the city. Um, and, then, and we need to look at that because we need a significant amount of permanent supportive housing, which the housing levy will help us uh, greatly with, um, but that's not gonna be enough. We're still gonna need to find ways to have permanent supportive housing. And then a big piece of where we need to be building is 50, the 50 to 60% AMI, which is largely workforce housing. And we need to reevaluate um, our mandatory housing law to require a certain percentage of on-site affordable housing. Um, how do we deal with the regional housing authority? Um, I think it, there's a lot of concern about whether or not it's actually been effective. So we've got another two years for them to basically show that they can pursue uh, their mission um, in a, an efficient and competent way. Um, I think part of the problem though is, again, we have a lot of duplicative efforts um, and we have particular, um, yeah, we, we had some ideology in that place. So what I think we need to be doing immediately is I think we need to adopt a pallet shelter policy. The thing about pallet shelters is they're a lot cheaper. Um, and they can also uh, allow for uh, health engagement hubs to be coordinated with the pallet shelters, which is really important because now we can use Sublicade to help people um, deal with the fentanyl addiction that is ravaging our communities and contributing to the homelessness issue. Thank you, Kathy. Our final prepared question this morning will be asked by Toby. If elected, which standing committees of the city council will you seek appointment to? What unique perspectives do you bring to the ongoing work of these committees, the specific committees? Thanks. Um, so I would seek to be appointed to, to the Public Safety and Human Services Committee. I think that this, um, the brief of that committee certainly um, aligns very well with my personal and professional experience. Um, the, you know, the committee focuses on developing policy and recommendations for criminal justice law and law enforcement with emphasis on programs and strategies to reduce crime, domestic violence, sexual assault. You know, that's all stuff that I've worked on as a judge, as well as a public defender and a volunteer for criminal legal 
um, reform systems. Um, the development and implementation of programs related to alternatives to police response. Um, police accountability, um, coordination with municipal and regional felony um, federal agencies engaged in public safety issues, uh, youth justice, alternatives to youth de detention and alternative housing options, um, human services, including but not limited to childcare, aging, disability, safe and thriving communities. So, you know, um, I've also, in addition to uh, being a judge and dealing with those issues and how, and dealing with bail reform um, <clears throat> and dealing with, excuse me, <clears throat> sentencing alternatives um, for people who are struggling with uh, drug and alcohol issues. Um, I also served as a child protective services worker. So I have frontline experience in actually working with families and helping to address the issues that they are confronted. Um, I've also served as a restorative justice facilitator. So I'm familiar with uh, the restorative justice model and think that that's a useful model to be looking at. Um, so I have a lot of uh, professional and personal. Also, as chair of the Seattle Human Rights Commission, we worked extensively on police accountability uh, and also the consent decree. And so I'm very. Thank you, Thank you Kathy. We'll now move in to the follow up part of our interview. These questions are unscripted and will come from our eboard members and they'll have one minute to respond to them. Our first follow-up will be from Toby. So kind of following up uh, on what you said about MHA, uh, the comp plan, the, the city's uh, five year or whatever huge long period of time comprehensive plan update is gonna be dealt with next year. So will you support requiring low-income housing on-site in areas that are being up-zoned? Uh, yes, absolutely. I, I think that that's been a, a problem with the Mandatory Housing Affordability Act is the ability for developers to simply put money in an in-lieu fund uh, rather than having a baseline requirement for a certain percentage of affordable housing. I know that I'm built on site and I know there's a lot of pushback from developers saying, well, we won't be able to afford to do that. Um, my position is that it simply is going to be a difference. It's a lower uh, profit margin um, than what they would normally get, but it's a public asset. Um, and it's our obligation as the city council to make sure that we are uh, stewarding that public asset wisely. And that means making sure affordable housing happens on site. Thank you, Kathy. Next follow-up will be from Amanda. <clears throat> yeah, this is a follow-up um, on the tax working group and uh, needing uh, needing to have uh, progressive revenue as well added in. Um, we've seen some resistance already um, to folks uh, looking at revenue rather than focusing solely on spending. How would you get the business community, for instance, on board with additional revenue sources um, ahead of, uh, or instead of just spending cuts or tightening your belt, as you said. Thanks. Yeah, I mean, I think that there, I, I, I do think the first step to trying to get the business community on board is to do an audit um, because, you know, that there's, that's always the talking point that there are a lot of inefficiencies. Um, and I think, Anytime you've got a, there, you know, there's going to be a, a significant turnover in the council. Um, and so I think anytime we have so many new people coming in, it's a good, uh, it's good for the council as a unit to um, have be on the same page and have all the same information in order for us to move forward. Um, so I, I do think that doing the audit is an essential step to um, both uh, establishing credibility that the council's taking that issue seriously, <clears throat> and then also giving us all the information um, so we're all on the same page. With um, and then just talking about, uh, again, <laughs> you know, the, the, the biggest fees are fire and police and public. That's what the business community says they want, and so we have to pay for that. Thank you. Sherry? Hi, um, 
I have, uh, let's see, my question is, what is your view on the current state of Seattle's drug use and possession laws? And what, if any, changes would you make? Um, <clears throat> so are you asking me, do I support codifying the state law? Um, I, I specifically for Seattle. Yeah. So the current Seattle uh, drug use and possession laws, and there was a vote, I believe it was in May or something that was a really close vote. So that sounds like there's a, like people who want to change things or not change things. I don't know. I was wondering what your views are on that. And going forward, what would you propose to do? So um, I, I do support codifying the state law into city law, um, partly because I think, um, I, I think it can be a slippery slope and a dangerous precedent if, this, if municipalities decide that they are not going to codify state laws, uh, because you can look at that with, uh, with the, the gun regulation and gun safety. So do we have municipalities deciding they're not going to codify those laws and follow them? Um, so aside from just sort of that procedural piece, I do think that we need to have it in place. Um, I know that people say, well, the police can arrest and uh, the King County Prosecutor's Office can prosecute, but they're not prosecuting. They've, they haven't prosecuted drug possession cases in a long, long time. It's not their priority. They have a lot of other things that are much more important. Um, but the other thing about implementing it is that there's a lot of money that comes for treatment. And the new bill, uh, the actual, you know, what it's rest and then divert into treatment. And I think that that is a critical piece. And we'll have time to do it. Thank you, Kathy. Toby? Uh, I'll be very fast. One word, trees. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Lots of them. <laughs> We need to absolutely redo the tree ordinance. It is a disaster. And we can have trees and housing. They are not uh, opposed to one another. And in fact, they're critically important to environmental justice. And we need a lot more trees in the South End because we have way too many heat islands down there. Um, and this idea that we're just going to cut trees here and put it into a fund so we can plant trees down there does nobody any good and it pits communities against one another. We need a holistic approach. And there's plenty of money in the general fund to actually be doing the kind of tree planting and restoration that we need, increasing parks, increasing small green spaces, mini parks. Uh, there are a lot of options. And also building up allows us to plant trees in right of ways. Thank you so much, Kathy. I'm going to jump in and ask you if you would expand a little bit. There was an article in the Seattle Times about the kind of public safety ideas of Seattle City Council candidates at the end of July, um, where, where people wanted to lead on public safety. And I, I believe you were quoted in that article of, of speaking about sex work. And I was just wondering if you wanted to kind of share a little bit more about your thoughts that you were quoted on in that article. Yeah, absolutely. I will happy to clarify that. So uh, this is a huge issue in District 5. We've had just an absolute proliferation of sex work on Aurora. Um, and with it has come a lot of additional crime uh, and a lot of gun violence. There's a lot of turf war going on between pimps um, and people are being killed. So it's something that absolutely needs to be addressed. My thinking is that we need to look more at um, some of the ways that it's being dealt with in Europe and in New Zealand. Um, I think that we need to basically uh, in-house sex work into regulate, regulated space and um, I mean, you know, uh, regulated institutions where people, we know people are there, the people who are there are there consensually, they're protected. Provided uh, appropriate, um, you know, they have regular pay, they have regular health care, um, and and it's a consensual practice. None of this answered. In no, of course, these are complex. These are really complex issues. Yeah. Absolutely. 
personally, I know that I'm not being recorded. I do not support, and this was a misunderstanding, I do not support criminalizing sex workers. My understanding is that in order for us to be able to prosecute pimps, which I do support, that the underlying act itself has to be criminal. And that's why I was talking about um, prostitution itself being criminal. Um, and even in the countries where they are, um, you know, in Sweden and other countries, the underlying act still remains criminal. When you look at Germany, where all of it has been decriminalized, there, the uh, increase in human trafficking has been exponential in sex work because everybody from Eastern Europe is coming. So it is a very, very complicated issue, but just clearly, I do not support criminalizing sex workers. Thank you so much. That concludes the formal part of our interview with you today, and we will um, 